This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, this is a spectacular week. You know why? Because some big news broke the day before the episode went live and I absolutely love it when that happens. Plus, I'm seeing Doctor Strange 2 tonight, so it's basically the best day ever, not gonna lie. Anyway, so what is the good news I'm so excited about? It's the fact that Soul Reaver is back, baby! Let's go! Okay, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just, let's take it down a notch and start at the beginning. As I was doing my weekly shop at Coles, I was standing there at the checkout waiting for my groceries to get bagged because I refuse to use those bullshit self-service kiosks God, I hate them so much. We're supposed to be on the moon by now, but instead we're calling over the attendant because apparently there's something in the bagging area when clearly there isn't. Anyway, how did I get onto this topic? That's right, video games. I was browsing my phone at the checkout line when this news broke. Embracer Group had purchased the bulk of Square Enix's Western Studios and IPs. Now that sentence alone is pretty crazy, but wait until I explain all the details of this deal because they are so weird and so wild. So, what do I mean when I say Square Enix's Western Studios? I'm talking Crystal Dynamics, makers of Marvel's Avengers, the latest Tomb Raider trilogy, the masterpiece tier Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver, and the crown jewel of them all, Gex. The deal also includes Eidos Montreal, makers of the recent and still unfinished Deus Ex games, as well as the absolutely superb Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Finally, it also includes Square Enix Montreal, which is a studio responsible for the very well-received and successful Go games. Stuff like Hitman Go, Lara Croft Go, etc. All in, it's three studios and 1,100 very talented developers for the low, low price of $300 million. Now that is a lie, because in addition to all of that talent, which is super hard to come by at the moment, by the way, and we'll come back to that, Embracer also gets the IP that these studios were stewards of. Tomb Raider is now the property of Embracer Group. Deus Ex is now the property of Embracer Group. 50 other back catalog franchises are now the property of Embracer Group, including, you guessed it, Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver which they specifically called out during the announcement as an opportunity franchise. So that is why I'm so excited today. For decades now, Square Enix have pretended that the legacy of Kane didn't even exist. And here the new owners are putting Kane and Raziel back on the map before the ink is even dry. I love it. I love it. I'm so happy. I just, I'm just, I'm so happy. Anyway, let's talk about the price tag. $300 million. I gotta say, and everybody else is saying it as well, it's an absolute steal. Consider that Sony just paid $3.6 billion for Bungie, who obviously are a very successful studio and have a very successful live service on their hands with Destiny, but Sony bought that studio for its talent, as evidenced by the wildly generous retention bonuses that Sony are offering to keep staff sticking around. Embracer themselves just bought Gearbox for $1.3 billion last year. That is a studio that does very well for itself, sure, and it has a small publishing arm attached to it, sure, but beyond Borderlands, it doesn't have much in the way of IP. Gearbox has got 1,300 employees, so it's not that much bigger than the 1,100 Embracer purchased from Square Enix today. So think about all of that, and then think about what Embracer are getting for $300 million. 1,100 very talented developers, many of whom live in Montreal, where there is a fierce war for developer talent going on right now. Trust me on that. They get two massive franchises in Tomb Raider and Deus Ex, both of which would be ripe for stuff like TV or movie spin-offs, and they get all that back catalog stuff, including stuff like Thief, which many people still hold a candle for, no pun intended. This deal is legit crazy, and it makes me think that Square Enix really, really wanted to sell. That shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. For over a decade now, Square Enix has been unsatisfied with the performance of its Western operations, lamenting the high cost of development in games like Tomb Raider, Marvel's Avengers, and Guardians of the Galaxy, while always communicating their dissatisfaction with sales numbers. And to be fair, all of these properties should have been slam dunk smash hits, but Square Enix's leadership clearly didn't know how to properly manage these properties. They look at the Avengers and they see live service dollars, and the failure of that game really poisoned the well when it came to Guardians of the Galaxy, severely limiting the potential audience for that game despite it being truly excellent. 
So yeah, I can totally see why Square Enix want to offload these studios and properties. They recognize that they aren't the right people to lead them. You wanna know the real reason they're doing it though? This is from Square Enix official investor statement on the matter, quote, the transaction enables the launch of new businesses by moving forward with investments in fields including blockchain, AI and the cloud, end quote. Imagine offloading 1,100 talented developers during a talent war, offloading three studios with great track records, two legendary IPs, and over 50 back catalog franchises, all so you can play harder in the monkey JPEG space. Unbelievable. The acquisition, if it is concluded, will make Embracer even more of a behemoth than it already is. Did you know that they currently employ around 14,000 people across a staggering 124 studios? And those studios have a combined 230 games in development, 30 of those being AAA. Ubisoft is on the brink of collapse right now, and when it does topple or change hands, Embracer Group will be the European-based games publisher we're all talking about. Definitely keep an eye on these guys, because they've already flagged a plan to spend billions more on acquisitions, and I won't be at all surprised if Embracer end up buying big chunks of Ubisoft when the time comes. We'll see, I guess. Pivoting back to Square Enix for a moment, this fire sale wasn't their only bad news headline for the week, but it was their least bad news headline. Top honors went to legendary game developer Yuji Naka, putting Square on blast, publicly disclosing details about their very, very ugly disagreements in the lead up to the release of the ill-fated Balan Wonderworld. This one's a messy one and a rare one in the world of game dev where dirty laundry is rarely aired. This week, Yuji Naka put out an open letter that opened with, quote, I was removed as the director of Balan Wonderworld about half a year before release, so I filed a lawsuit against Square Enix. Now that the proceedings are over and I'm no longer bound by company rules, I'd like to speak out. He'd go on to describe that he was removed as director of the project in the months leading up to launch, which he would describe as a critical window in game dev, because that is when important decisions and improvements are made to elevate the final product. He says that Square Enix prohibited him from doing that work in this vital phase, and that's why he sued, because ultimately it was his reputation on the line. He'd go on to voice his dissatisfaction with the state of Balan Wonderworld, quote, I personally regret that Balan Wonderworld was released to the world in an unfinished state. I wanted to consider all kinds of things and release it as a proper action game, I don't think that Square Enix and Arzest value games and their fans, end quote. Oof, that is a real haymaker at the end there, and a hard one to argue with after Square's recent worship at the altar of NFTs. Still, and not to defend Square Enix here, but I didn't play Ball and Wonderworld, but everything I read about it didn't frame it as an unfinished game, more just a very, very bad game. I do wonder what another six or even 12 months in development could have done for a game that was so universally lambasted, but Naka seems to think it could have done a lot. Either way, the court case is settled now and it appears as though he and Square Enix will just get on with life. Square Enix did have one good news story this week though, and that's that Final Fantasy 16 is in the final stages of development. God Emperor himself, Yoshi P, provided the update, who did an interview with Uniqlo Magazine, which is a free magazine given away at a clothing store, okay? It was it was just a brief mention, but he did say, quote, development of the latest title, Final Fantasy 16, is in its final stages, end quote. It follows earlier comments back in October 2021, where Yoshi P said that they were putting the finishing touches on the game back then. So this final phase of development has lasted for at least six months. It does give us hope that the title may launch this year, but that's still a long shot as it's possible the game will need to go through extensive quality assurance testing and polishing. Either way, it's nice to imagine sitting down with a brand new numbered final Final Fantasy game sometime soon, something we haven't had since Final Fantasy 15 all those years ago. And that was a very conflicted product. That's what I'm talking about. Minced meat is the key to every perfect cup of noodles. Also briefly, RGG Studios provided an update on the next Yakuza game. Studio boss Yokohama-san said that development is steadily progressing and that the writing team is currently working on the climax of the story, with some actors already recording in the studio. There is no release date for this title yet, but given that sort of update, it certainly isn't coming this year, so look toward a 2023 release or beyond. While we're knocking over quick stuff, Xbox has announced the date for its big showcase. You know, the one that would typically occur during E3? E3 is cancelled this year 
and maybe permanently cancelled for all we know, but Xbox remained committed to that timing window. So on Sunday, June 12th at 10am PT, Xbox and Bethesda will be hosting a joint showcase where Phil and Todd can show us what their studios have been working on this past while. Obviously, we can expect to see updates on big hitting franchises like Halo, Gears of War and Forza, and we're definitely going to see a boatload of Starfield because if we don't, then we ought to be really worried about that November release date. And we're also going to hear from Xbox's chunky stable of studios, all of whom are working on the next crop of Xbox exclusives, including stuff like Avowed, Hellblade 2, Perfect Dark and more. I always love these showcases, but will I be up at 3am Sydney time to watch it? Probably yes. I'll just snort some G Fuel and I'll be fine. Ah, it's a stuff. How about some Sony Pony news? Well, this story broke last week, just as this show was about to go to air, but we got some new details on Sony's promised game trial program, a perk exclusive to the highest tier of PS Plus when it gets its Game Pass-like refresh in June. Most of us expected this to be a rather select program of game trials, like maybe a handful of them each month, but that isn't the case. The news comes from GameDeveloper.com, who managed to confirm from a number of sources that every new PlayStation game going forward that costs more than $34 US dollars must have a two-hour trial available on the store, or a demo, one of the two. The demos will be free to all, of course, but the two-hour trials will be exclusive to PS Plus's highest tier, so you're essentially paying a premium to be able to try out games before you buy them. Now look, this move created a lot of discussion for a lot of reasons. Many worried that this is being forced onto developers who may not want to offer these sorts of time trials for their games, especially if the game is only a few hours long, as are some indies. It's a valid concern and also one that exists in the context of Steam, which offers a no questions asked refund policy for any purchase so long as you've played it for less than two hours. Some worried that this would create extra work for developers, but that isn't the case since these time trials are literally just access to the full game that is revoked after two hours has elapsed. So it's not like developers need to create standalone demos, which would have been a lot more work. Most people, myself included, just don't like the fact that you have to pay for a try before you buy Scheme. I love the PlayStation are offering this. It's cool that people will get to make more informed purchase decisions, but to force people to shell out roughly 20 bucks a month to be able to do that, that sucks. I'm still of a view that the PS Plus mid-tier is the sweet spot for this new service, offering a nice back catalogue at a reasonable price, and I really don't think that the inclusion of paid game trials does the highest tier any favours. Okay, so this next story, I really couldn't believe it. Meta, aka Facebook, are balls deep on the metaverse. So balls deep, in fact, they are willing to lose an absolutely obscene amount of money to make it happen. How much? Well, in the last quarter, so just three months, Facebook lost roughly $3 billion in their Reality Labs division, which is an amalgamation of all their software and hardware initiatives to kickstart the metaverse. $3 billion in a single quarter. Remember at the start of this episode when I said that Embracer bought three studios and decades worth of established IPs for 300 million bucks? This is 10 times that amount of money, and it was spent in a single quarter. What do Facebook have to show for it? Well, to be fair, the Oculus product is doing pretty well since that's a great piece of kit, but that isn't being purchased so people can spend time in the metaverse. That's being bought for Beat Saber and various VR websites. The actual metaverse that Facebook is trying to build is called Horizon Worlds. And man, you really need to see this. $3 billion a quarter for a game that looks like a worse version of Metopia. I just, I really can't get over how bad this looks. VR chat is better than this. Rec Room is better than this. PlayStation Home was better than this. And that was in like 2008. Game developers I follow on Twitter were all aghast to see how much money Facebook is burning and the rate of that burn. And with so little to show for it, you really have to wonder when Facebook shareholders step in and put an end to the Zuck's Ready Player One ambitions. Hey, remember Skull and Bones? That game's been in development since Noah wore short pants. I played this thing back in E3 2018 and back then I was like, Nah, man, this ain't it. It was basically just a repurposing of the ship combat found in Assassin's Creed Black Flag and not much else. After the universally negative feedback the game received, it was rumored that Ubisoft rebooted the title and it was hoped that part of that reboot would involve allowing us to get out of our ships and do pirate stuff on foot, similar to something like Sea of Thieves. These hopes were dashed this week when six minutes of Skull and Bones footage leaked and yeah man, <laughs> it's the same as it was back in 2018 and you still can't get out of your pirate ship. I mean you can, but that's only to walk around the pirate town where you can collect bounties and purchase upgrades 
experience. Much like Ghost Recon Breakpoint, it feels like this little hub only exists to motivate people to purchase cosmetics for their characters. The worst part is that the game has a resource collection component where you have to mine ore and collect lumber. And to do this, I'm not making this up, you literally drive your ship up to a cliffside and you shoot at it. Or you park your ship alongside an island where some invisible saw will start hacking down a tree. I laughed heartily when I saw this gameplay, for real. I'm sure you guys will see this soon since Ubisoft have just acknowledged these leaks and promised some official updates soon, but boy, boy, I really don't know about this one. Turning briefly to Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard, this week, 98% of Activision Blizzard shareholders voted to approve the deal. Not at all surprising, given that the current offer from Microsoft represents a 24% premium over the current price of Activision Blizzard shares. This gap indicates that the market isn't 100% certain that this acquisition will go through, as it has to clear a number of hurdles, including FTC approval. One investor is very bullish on the deal though, Warren Buffett. It was earlier revealed that the Wizard of Omaha had purchased Activision Blizzard stock before the acquisition was even announced, and since then he's purchased even more. He now owns nearly 10% of Activision Blizzard stock up from just under 2% late last year. His purchase is classic acquisition arbitrage, where he sees a gap between the current and the purchase price and makes a bet where others are more cautious. I have no idea how all this breaks, but Buffett certainly knows an opportunity when he sees one, and I for one would not be betting my life savings against him. Speaking of Blizzard, at around the time this video goes live, we'll be getting our first look at the Warcraft mobile game that Blizzard discussed some time back. There are actually two mobile games in development, and according to Jez Corden and Jason Schreier, one of those was cancelled. It was the Pokemon Go style World of Warcraft offshoot, which was a cool concept to be honest, so it's kind of a bummer to see it get shit canned. No word yet on what this other mobile offering will be, but I'm still holding out hope that it's some sort of RTS style experience. Since those do fairly well on mobile, and Blizzard certainly aren't going to make any more of those for PC or console anytime soon, so I'll take what I can get. I usually like to end the news block with some good vibes, but sadly, that isn't the case this week, because this final story is our most heartbreaking edition of No Fucking Thanks Yet. I regret to inform you, and this is hard for me to say, Reggie is an NFT, bro. Oh god, it hurts. It hurts so much. But it's true. Speaking at the SXSW Festival in Austin, Reggie was asked for his thoughts on crypto, blockchain, and NFTs when he gave this gut-wrenching response, quote, I'm also a believer in the concept of play to own within video games, said fils -Aimee. And I say this as a player where I may have invested 50 hours in a game, 100 hours in a game. There's some games I've invested 300 hours in a game. And when I'm ready to move on to something else, wouldn't it be great to monetize what I've built, end quote? Reggie offered an example, suggesting that many folks would be interested in buying his Animal Crossing New Horizons Island and how he would like to be able to monetize that, quote, Blockchain technology embedded in the code and in the development would enable me to do that. So I'm a believer in the technology and where it's headed." End quote. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to propose that we monetize Animal Crossing Islands. I honestly give it no more than three months until Reggie announces that he's joined the board of some spivvy crypto NFT bullshit startup, because there is no way that he says something like this unless someone is paying him a lot of money to say it clock is running people three months set your watches so what got announced or delayed this week well in stark contrast to last week this one has been very light on announcements indeed the first is a brief update on Baldur's gate 3 earlier we heard from a member of the dev team that the game would probably slip into 2023 as they continue to fine tune things in early access that was officially confirmed this week when developer larian studios put out a blog posting where they locked in that 2023 window without providing a specific date. Only other delay was for that cat game called Stray. Remember that one? When this was revealed, cat people around the world were like, finally, a video game that gets me. Details on this one are light, but you do play as a cat wandering around a cyberpunk inspired cityscape just doing cat stuff, I guess. I don't know, no one really knows. It was meant to be releasing Northern Spring this year, 
but has just been pushed to summer, no specific date yet. So what came out last week? Well, pretty chunky week of releases actually. Kicking things off was June Spice Wars, which hit early access. This one has done really well for itself. Its brand recognition has helped it cut through. So a number of outlets have taken the time to check it out. Almost all of them having positive things to say. IGN scored it an eight saying, quote, June Spice Wars is a layered, clever, generally well-balanced RTS with great faction diversity that feels more or less finished even in its current early state, end quote. Steam reviews were the same. The game sits at around 81% very positive with nearly 2,000 reviews in. Turns out that this is a sort of 4X RTS hybrid and it's meant to be great. I have this one installed and I'll be booting it up sometime this week. Tactics based RPG King Arthur Knight's Tale hit 1.0 last week after its early access period. Not a whole lot in the way of critic reviews for this one, but recent Steam reviews are following the early access trend, tracking at 85% very positive, which is a great result for developer Neocore Games. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe Edition launched this week and it has gone gangbusters, selling over 100,000 units in its first few days alone, which isn't exactly Elden ring numbers, but for a little indie title like this, that's bloody impressive. The update is being hailed by critics and fans alike as a very, very worthwhile glow up, adding a huge amount of new content that is in perfect keeping with the original's quirky tenor. And I can say that now since I've actually played it this week, and yep, it's awesome. I've done maybe half a dozen endings, but it's rare to find a game that makes you laugh as much as this one does. I don't think I'll do a full video review of it, so this will have to suffice. I recommend the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe Edition. Another game that launched into 1.0 this week is Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt. Now, first up, I have to issue a correction because last week I said the player counts for this were averaging in the hundreds during the early access window, but that wasn't true because those numbers were actually for internal testing only. Public test windows were averaging around two to 3,000 players, which is obviously a much stronger result, but it's nowhere near what developer Shark Mob have achieved at the launch, since the game is currently sitting at around 20,000 concurrent players at the time of recording, and that number has been climbing over the past week. That's a very strong result, so congrats to the team on that. The reviews for this one are hovering at around the 70% range, but don't forget that this is free to play, so you can check it out for yourself on both PC and PS5. Dwarf Romantic is that cute, chilled out little builder puzzle hybrid I've mentioned a few times now. It also hit 1.0 this week and is still as beloved as it was during its early access period with 93% very positive on Steam. Rogue Legacy 2, yet another 1.0 release this week after nearly two years in early access and what an absolute banger this one is. A mighty 89 on open critic, 100% of critics recommending it, 89% very positive on Steam. I've also spent some time with this one this week and I was just immediately bowled over by how slick it all is. Presentation, controls, UI, combat, class design. It reminds me a lot of Hades, which makes sense since they're both indie roguelikes, but just that commitment to quality and polish and excellence that Hades had in spades, Rogue Legacy 2 exudes that in every frame. I expect this one will stay installed on my Steam Deck for a long time to come. Nintendo had another swing at Wii Sports. Get it? Swing? Anyway, Nintendo Switch Sports doesn't have quite the same ring to it that Wii Sports did, and it looks like the game may suffer a similar fate. It's sitting at a pretty mid-73 on Open Critic. IGN scored it a 7, saying, quote, Nintendo Switch Sports successfully recaptures the party game magic of Wii Sports, but quickly falls victim to a lack of depth that holds it back from achieving greatness, end quote. While GameSpot landed in the same 7 out of 10 territory, saying, quote, Nintendo's latest motion-controlled sports game re-sparks the magic of playing with others, but not without a few fumbles along the way, end quote. The last and biggest release of the week was the release of Overwatch 1. I mean, Overwatch 2's beta. Now listen, I have not played Overwatch for years. I dumped a bunch of hours into it at and around launch, but then I dipped before Sombra shipped, so that was a long time ago. And I've also not gotten into the Overwatch 2 beta, but I have watched some of it, and I've spoken to plenty of people playing it, and I'm yet to meet anyone that's like, oh yeah baby, this is it, they've done it, let's go. The worst case scenario for Overwatch 2 was that it would be a minor update that just feels like a patch, and on the PvP side of the fence, that appears to be the case, with even the more fundamental game changes, like the move to 5v5, being the sort of thing that a live service game would have shipped in a seasonal update patch. Obviously, we're yet to get our hands on the PvE stuff, but that had better be pretty damn good, because if the PvP beta is anything to go by, Overwatch 2 is pretty much just Overwatch 1, but with a new hat. And that is not going to be enough to get Overwatch back to center stage in what is now an extremely competitive shooter market. 
So I guess just watch this space. So what's coming out this week? Just three releases to shout out this week. The first is Loot River arriving for both PC and Xbox today, where it will be a day one Game Pass release. I tried desperately to get a review code for this. I hit up the developer on Twitter, DMs, emails, nada. I'm bummed out because I would have loved to have reviewed this one since I've been super pumped for it since the moment I laid eyes on it. It just looks so awesome. I will certainly be booting it up this week. Hopefully it runs on Steam Deck because this looks like a great fit for a handheld. I was more successful in my quest to get hold of a Trek to Yomi review code. This 2D side-scrolling samurai epic releases on the 5th on all platforms bar the Switch. Plus it too is a day one Game Pass release. I've played and finished this one. I'm not allowed to say anything yet as I'm under embargo, but I will have a review up on the embargo. So if you'd like to know the minute that review is live, just hit the subscribe button, ding the notification bell, and boom, you're set. Too easy. Final release is Warhammer 40k Chaos Gate Demon Hunters. Man, those Warhammer games really love their like subtitled subtitles, don't they? They're addicted to colons. Anyway, Demon Hunters is a tactics based RPG set in the iconic universe. I really don't know too much about this one, except that Andy Serkis, Golem himself, is the voice of one of the characters. So that's pretty cool. It's exclusive to PC and it's out on May 5th. Put this on your radar. This is Source of Madness, and it comes from Swedish-based studio Carrie Castle. They've done some smaller stuff before, but this is certainly the most ambitious looking project. They described it as a, quote, side-scrolling action roguelike set in a twisted Lovecraftian-inspired world powered by procedural generation and AI machine learning, end quote. I was really surprised to hear that this had elements of procedural generation because the art is so striking. You get the feeling that all of this would be really linear, but Carrie Castle have obviously found a way to make it work and the results look pretty damn spectacular. This one has been an early access since September of last year and has had some really solid reviews since then. They've just announced that the game is coming out this week for both Steam and GOG. I bought this one. I think it looks super cool. It gives me strong blasphemous vibes and that game totally ruled. I'm looking forward to playing through it this week and if you're at all interested then you can grab it right now or you can grab it on the 5th when it launches into 1.0 or you can just wishlist it in case you want to grab it when it goes on sale. I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time and you did it. You made it through April and here you are, bright eyed and bushy tailed, ready for May's swag of sort of free stuff. Plenty of good stuff this month actually so let's just hop in. Kicking off, as always, is the Epic Game Store, who right now are giving away Just Die Already, which is a very morbid PvP sandbox game where you play as old people trying to kill each other. That's literally the gag, just old people murdering each other. In addition to that, there's the very weird but apparently very good adventure game Paradigm. These are on shelf until the 6th, at which point you can grab Terraforming Mars, which I don't know much about, but it positions itself as a digital strategy board game, obviously centered on terraforming the red planet into something inhabitable. It's got some pretty solid Steam reviews, so it might be worth checking out, especially at this price tag. Game Pass isn't getting a whole lot this week, except for Trek to Yomi, which arrives on the 5th. Like I said, I'll have a review up before that time, so keep an eye out for it. Memes with gold. I mean, games with gold. It's back. This month, Xbox will receive Yoku's Island Express, which to be fair is actually pretty good, so can't complain on that one. The Inner World, The Last Wind Monk is a point and click adventure game with a quirky art style released back in 2017. I have no idea what it's about. Hydro Thunder Hurricane is a speedboat racing game. Okay then. And finally, Viva Piñata Party Animals is there for some Xbox 360 era party game shenanigans. PS Plus will soon go through its sort of glow up, but for now, it's just the regular old PS Plus we've known and loved for years. Though to be fair, we've loved it more on some months than others. This month is pretty solid. On the PS4, you can get Curse of the Dead Gods, which is a top-down roguelike that unfortunately released a little too close to Hades, so it kind of got swallowed up in the comparisons there. Still, it's meant to be pretty solid, as evidenced by my friend Wizfish, who did a great review of it. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. If you're into gambling, then FIFA 2022 is available for PS5. Knock yourself and your bank account out. Finally, Tribes of Midgard is available for both PS4 and PS5. This is an interesting little Norse-themed ARPG that supports up to like 10 players co-op, I think, maybe more. It released a while back and since then the developers have released numerous updates and they're promising more in the future. Good one to add to the library since it'll no doubt evolve and improve with time. Finally, Twitch Prime is coming in pretty strong this week. Remember that if you are subscribed to either Amazon Prime or Twitch Prime, then you get these games because Amazon Prime and Twitch Prime are actually the same thing. 
This month you can get survival horror sci-fi classic Dead Space 2. Last month we got Monkey Island 2, but this month we're going back to where it all began with Uncle Jeff giving us the curse from Monkey Island 1. And the only other game I'd put on your radar is Shattered Tale of the Forgotten King, which launched last year to OK reviews. This one is an open world Souls-like with a beautiful art style, so it may not be up there with the FromSoft classics, but it might hold some appeal if you're looking for a different take on the formula. Our feel-good story for the week is one close to my heart, for it pertains to a product that I have great affection for. The Fisher-Price Laugh and Learn Game and Learn Controller. Long has it been the Trojan horse with which we indoctrinate the next generation of gamers, getting them used to the supple curvature of the side grips, the precise finger positioning of the shoulder buttons, and the way that Dorito dust improves grip and responsiveness on the analog stick. Shrewd dads have handed these controllers to their kids and said, yeah, you can play too, we'll play at the same time, when really the dad just wanted to get in a few more millennia wipes before bed. Well, the Fisher-Price controller has evolved thanks to a YouTuber by the name of Rudism. This is a dude who famously proclaims to play games wrong, clearing Dark Souls games with a Guitar Hero controller, or a dance mat, or my personal favourite, playing Winston with a network of actual bananas all hooked up to somehow form a controller. Rudism's latest project was, you guessed it, making the Fisher-Price controller a real controller. He pulled it apart, put some actual components in it, added a USB port at the top, and voila, a new next-gen controller was born. Here he is playing Elden Ring with it, but he's also shown off that the controller works just fine in games like Tony Hawk. Best of all, the controller retains its lights at the center and all of its annoying sound effects. I'm certain that some Fisher-Price executive is looking at this right now and seeing dollar signs, and to be honest, they aren't wrong. I'd buy two of these if they ever shipped retail, so hopefully Fisher-Price get right on that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the week in video games. I hope you enjoyed yourself this week. I know I did. If you had any fun at all, or found any of it useful, or you just want to help your boy out, then I would love it if you could click that like button. Thank you very much, appreciate you. If you want to come back next week or for the odd game review here and there, then be sure to click the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. Like I said, this week is going to be the Trick to Yomi review, and after that, I don't know. I'm playing a bunch of cool stuff this week like the Stanley Parable, and June Spice Wars, and Rogue Legacy 2, and Source of Madness. So I'll see what takes my fancy. Thanks for stopping by, and a big thanks to this video sponsor, Squarespace. Are you an artist, photographer, or someone who works in the visual mediums? If so, I'm jealous of you. I wish I had skills like that. Imagine being able to draw something and it not look terrible. That would be cool. Anyway, if you fall into that category and you are looking to promote your work, then you might want to think about publishing a portfolio somewhere. And there's no better tool to help you do that than Squarespace. Squarespace have ready-made portfolio templates that you can select and immediately begin customizing to your personal taste. When you're happy with the design, you can begin uploading your work and it's going to look super professional because that's Squarespace's speciality, professional looking websites. It's not just about looks though, Squarespace can help you promote your work through email campaigns, through SEO tools, and through social media integration, so your work can be discovered and shared. You don't need any knowledge or experience to get started with this stuff, Squarespace have put in all the work to make the entire process so easy and so seamless, even for absolute beginners. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace are a long-running partner of this channel, three years running now actually. I really appreciate that support. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career, and that's what they do for a lot of people, because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is a really good place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com, and if you really want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.